While Red Bull denied us a look at their real car during launch season, their car that's come out in testing is one of the most interesting on the grid. In this video, we're going to walk from the front to the back of the car and talk about some of the more intriguing features on this particular car's aero kit. For those of you that are new to my channel, I was an aerodynamicist for Mercedes for the 2018, 19 and 20 Formula 1 seasons and I now work as a consultant designing aerodynamics kits for race cars in all different classes all around the world. Now a lot of people have been really interested in the side pods of this car because it's the most visually obvious thing. However, from my perspective, I find some of the detailing around the floor edge and the floor leading edge to be far more interesting. That's not to say I won't cover the side pods in this video, but we're really going to get into the meat of what's going on around the floor as well. Let's dive straight into the analysis. Now before we start this video, it's just worth noting that there looks like there's a few panels on the car that might be a little bit unfinished and there are rumors of updates coming to the car. But then again, what car isn't going to see some fairly large updates over the course of this season? So I think that it's still worth analyzing what we've got here. And of course, this video comes with a standard disclaimer that the flow fields around geometries like this are very complicated. And as such, my predictions are at best theories of what I think the flow is going to do based on my past experience and knowledge. Now, I won't spend too much time on the front wing, but just some general notes on it are that it's got that detached first element similar to the, what I would say the majority of the grid have gone for. You'll note that the top edges of the end plates are pretty outwashing. If you look at where this leading edge goes down here versus where we've got the trailing edge along here, it looks like we've got a fairly outwashing end plate on both sides of the front wing. And then below that, the dive plane is a pretty conventional setup as well. Now let's get on to the first item of intrigue, which is the suspension layout. Now, this particular car has gone for the same setup to the, to the McLaren. So we've got a pull rod front suspension here. And then at the back, we've got a push rod suspension going the other way. Now, the other thing that's of note is that we've got these really heavily rearwards canted top arms. So in side view, if you imagine that this was your wheel here and the, the rear of your car is, is that way, then what we'd have is we'd have the top arm is leaning back like this here. And the bottom, it looks like, is leaning back a little bit as well, just not perhaps as far. Now, my suspicion for this is that it's predominantly for mechanical reasons. All the cars are running a very different rake and overall ride height setups compared to last year. It makes sense that some teams will be playing around with their suspension geometry to achieve a good compromise between ride and aero platform control. With this particular wishbone geometry, it's likely they're playing around with their ante, so they're perhaps trying to help their pitch control under braking. But without actually knowing the pickup point locations, we can't get exact numbers on that. Now, there are two main reasons why I think this geometry is mechanical and not aerodynamic. Now, the first is that if we look back at that wheel with the slant, we've got our slanty arms like that. And the rules define your, your cladding on your wishbones that you're allowed to have. So you can obviously have an airfoil section uh, on each wishbone like that. However, the legality is defined with respect to the Z0 plane of the car, not with respect to the arm angle. So basically, this can be at a certain angle with respect to the, the Z0 plane. So having the arms at more of an angle doesn't actually allow you to put the cladding on the wishbone at any more of an angle. And they're not close enough to each other to be acting as a cascade either. So I don't think we'll be seeing any sort of additional downwash from this design compared to a more conventional design. Now, the other reason I don't think that this is a downwash enhancing move and is more to do with the mechanical aspects of things is that when you have a look at this pull rod right here, it's very minimal section. They've really slimmed down the aero fairing over it. It's really obvious from the top view. And if their section is that minimal, it means that they're trying to get it as small as they can package around what they structurally require to get the pull rod to work, which theoretically should need less section than a push rod. And then they've obviously been trying to minimize the impact and effect uh, of this particular rod on the aerodynamics of the car. Now, as discussed previously in some of my analysis videos, the rear selection of push rod makes a lot of sense to me. The diffuser roof is quite high. We're trying to get that airflow to run cleanly down the side pod and be clean all the way through to the beam wing. So moving that rod up makes a lot of sense to me. Moving back to the mid floor, I want to talk a little bit about the Red Bull tea tray. Because while they haven't done anything trick like some of the other guys have done in terms of double tea trays or anything like that, the Red Bull implementation is a rather unusual one. What they've got is they've got their little tea tray along here and around here like that. 
And then they've got the, the main floor body is going around in this big old loop here. You can see that's a really fat floor body edge compared to a lot of the other guys which are running relatively small keel style setups in the center running over the top of the tea tray. Now, at first glance, you'd probably think, oh, that tea tray is really small. They're not running out to legality, but have a quick look at the legality boxes. This here is the legality box for the tea tray. And this is the legality box for the main floor volume there. You can see there's only actually a very small amount that sticks out that you can use for the tea tray if you were to use the whole of the floor legality volume. If you look at it in 3D, what you'll see is that it gives you a narrow little tea tray that you can put in like that. And then you go to a big fat floor body that would look something like that and go up that way like that. Now that you've seen that, let's have a look back at the real thing. So we can see on the real thing, it does look like they're more or less filling the legality boxes all the way to the maximum on both the floor volume and on the tea tray itself. Now, why are they doing this and what are the effects? At the front of this really fat keel, you'll have a high pressure stagnation region. Now, I don't think that's necessarily desirable. There'll be a bit of drag on there and there'll be a little bit of positive pressure on the underside of the nose, which would generate lift. This high pressure region should help with generating local load on this particular portion of the tea tray. However, that particular portion is only quite small. And we'll obviously get some vortices spooled up and shed off there, but they won't be quite as powerful as some of the teams with full size tea trays. So why would Red Bull want to use this solution? On paper, it sounds like it's not great. What I reckon they're doing is they're playing around with their pressure distribution in their forward tunnels. What I think is going on is, is that if you have a really fat section through here where you maximize your pressure at the front, you're then already wide from this point back. So your curvature profile from top down will look something like this instead of something like that. Now, given the floor leading edge comes in somewhere around here, what this would do is that this particular blue line should have more suction around the four leading edge through the main body because the volume that they've got in the tunnels is physically smaller there and it's got a better curvature distribution. So it should have more suction around that floor leading edge compared to the green line, which is more similar to what other teams run. So you would expect uh, back on the 3D model that there'd be more suction in this particular region here with this design. So that's what I think they're probably getting at here. It probably also indicates that they're their mid body of the floor back here is probably also close out to legality, which would give you a decent amount of floor plan form that would be right at the minimum legal limit. And that should be able to generate quite a lot of suction, particularly when you're at lower ride heights. Looking a bit further outboard, Red Bull runs a barge board configuration that we've not seen on any other teams in that they have actually two separate barge boards. So we have one particular one, you can see its edge along here, and then you have another one that has its edge going along there. Now to fit this in, they've obviously got both of these barge boards in the forward extending section of the legality box indicated here. Now what they're doing with this arrangement and why they've chosen it is actually an interesting thing to ponder. The general appearance of the barge boards is one that the two edges are converging together. So if we look from dead top down view, basically what you'd have is you'd have the, the outer barge board going like that. And then you'd have the inner barge board would start out here somewhere and come in tighter like that. That's more or less what looks like is going on, judging by the, what's going on at the top edges. Now, because this area has a certain inlet size and it's shrinking along here, the air needs to go somewhere. So as a result, we have to look at where the air is going in a three dimensional sense. Basically, if this area is shrinking, all that's going to happen is that the excess air has to pop out either the top or out the bottom. So what I'm basically thinking is that this layout is going to power up the vortex on the inboard most of these strakes. So there's going to be a vortex that's going to be running that way on the inboard most of the strakes. And then this jet of air down could either just, just go towards the ground or maybe, maybe it is shedding a vortex that starts to spin in the opposite direction. And that basically would, would jet the air in such a manner that it would go down and then spread out along the ground like that as it's driven by the two vortices. Now this could be a useful situation in terms of managing the tire weight because that tire weight is gonna come down along here like this and this jet should help push it that away. This should keep the tire weight a little bit more out of the floor. And if we can keep that tire weight out of the floor, we're gonna help with the floor performance. 
Now the problem with this theory is we don't know whether or not uh, this converging channel that they've got has sufficient power to generate a counter-rotating vortex there. So maybe they're both still rotating in the same particular direction and it's, it's just powering up the inboard one and having a very weak vortex on the outboard one. However, we can learn quite a lot about which way the vortices are spinning on this geometry by the shedding edge details. This gives away quite a lot, so let's have a closer look there. If you actually trace the top edge detailing on the barge boards, what you'll see is that the, the inboard barge board has a little bit of curvature going this way out, so it's, it's actually curving that way out like that, along there. And the outboard barge board actually has the curvature on the top edge in the same direction. If you follow these curves and how this is all tapered and blended, what you'll see is that if we were looking from behind, you would basically have a shedding edge detail that looks more or less like that. Now this typically indicates that you have a vortex that is spooling up and going that away. That's generally speaking how you would do a shedding edge geometry here. Now the fact that both of these shedding edge geometries are detailed in the same manner suggests to me that the jet that I'm thinking that's coming out the top of, of this converging barge board region is actually not enough to create any counter-rotating vorticity on the outboard barge board. I think that actually the fact that the barge board is still outwashing is causing the flow that hits it to still push the, the vorticity so that it rolls that way. So I think there is more pressure at the top at least on the outside of the barge board than the inside of the barge board. So both of these vortices should both be spinning in the same way off that detailing, which is quite interesting to note because I think from top down view, when you look at it, and certainly when I first looked at it, I thought they were probably counter rotating. Now looking at the bottom section, it's a little bit different. Now we obviously can't see the bottom edge of the inboard barge board, but I'm pretty certain that it would be generating a vorticity that was spinning that way, spinning in the direction that all the other main straight vorticity is spinning and go up and be ingested into the tunnels but we can see the outboard strike, and that actually is telling us a reasonable amount. It looks like there's some reasonable rounding in this portion here. So that's suggesting that either we've got limited vorticity or perhaps vorticity going into the inboard side of the strike. However, as we go further rearwards, it flares out. You can actually see it start to flare a little bit that way, like that. Now some of this is naturally because we've, we've got a downwashing flow that's coming down through the back of this channel and so we're going to flare it out and curl it to try and get extraction there. But I wouldn't be surprised if this particular detail is actually able to kick a fair amount of mass flow outwards and maybe it's an indication that they are starting to get some form of roll up on the back. It's really impossible to tell unless we capture some flow vis of this area or even then we might still not be able to tell because the vortices would be quite off body but I wouldn't be surprised at all if they are essentially creating some form of system that is basically powering up the mass flow that's coming down in this direction and giving us some form of mechanism by which to outwash the lower wake outwards. It's also worth noting that the rules prohibit the strakes from being less than 10 millimeters apart on virtual surfaces. However, the strakes can extend four millimeters from the virtual surface on each side. So theoretically, the gap at the rear of these strakes could come closing down to as low as two millimeters. Now this outboard double barge board system obviously has a fairly sizable effect on how they have to use the rest of their strake system because now they've essentially lost one of the strakes they could use in the main body by putting in the barge board. So in this front view, what we've got is this is the leading edge of the outermost barge board there. That's the leading edge of the innermost barge board there. Then we have the outermost, what I'd consider a strake. Uh, and it's worth noting that there's a little bit of perspective going on here. So I don't think that's quite as close uh, to the barge board as it does look there. And then we have the innermost strake there. Now, the outermost strake seems to pair very closely with the other two barge boards. So maybe uh, this converging uh, barge board system has powered up the, the vortices on the underside uh, of that barge board quite a lot. So maybe they want to try and spread it. Uh, across two shedding edges by using this this outboard most strake uh, to depower the the innermost barge board and therefore they can support that barge board clean up these vortices a little bit but still get good vorticity into the tunnels that could be why that positioning is so and then the innermost strake seems that its nose is very close to the center line you could see in the tea tray shots just how close that is and then it looks like, judging by just a little bit of the grayness on this picture through here, that it has quite an aggressive angle on it as it starts to move downstream and outboard. So that to me looks like it's quite a strong 
uh, strake, it could be shedding a very strong vortex structure off it uh, that could be feeding the main tunnel and generating quite a lot of suction on the roof. Now, when you look at the side view of this region, you can see that there is one strake visible at the exit. Now there's two potential strake layouts I propose here that could both exist. Um, we have this option and this option. Unfortunately, we won't know for sure which one it is until the car crashes or someone gets a good shot of the underfloor. Moving to some mid-car detailing, the mirror is quite an interesting one. We see this sort of housed mirror structure that we've been seeing for a few years now, uh, where we have some sort of basically winglet around the main mirror body. But the interesting detail in this particular mirror is to be found in this region right here. Because what we've got there is we've got essentially, it looks to me like some form of little mini detached winglet along there. So you can see that this is clearly attached to the mirror. That's clearly off the main body of the mirror. It's split off. This looks like this might be a little free shedding edge here. And I'm thinking that given the shape of this, where this particular portion uh, concaves and dips in, that what we're gonna see is that this design is all about generating maximum outwash. So obviously we've, we've got a portion here uh, that's kind of a bit like a gurney flap, but then we've got the, the void behind. So maybe we're generating a vortex, putting a bit of mass flow into there and then flicking out that way. And it's just gonna take any airflow from here and kick it out that way. And this really shows you how far teams are going to try and maximize uh, the outwashing of the wake. Because apart from outwashing wake here, I don't see why you would need such an aggressive attempt at an outwashing mirror. Now we get to the bit that I'm sure you're all waiting for, which is of course, the side pod. Now conceptually speaking, it's not actually that radical. This sort of deep undercut we've seen on the Aston and the Alpha Tauri. We've seen the downwashing rearwards portion to the diffuser floor on the Alpha Tauri as well. I've discussed these bits in a fair amount of depth on those videos, so go and check those out if you want more info on that. The main difference on the Red Bull is the location of the upper leading edge, where on the other cars the upper leading edge is forwards, the Red Bull has pulled it back quite substantially. So let's explore a little bit why they could have done that. While I couldn't possibly know exactly what they're doing with it, I have a few reasonable guesses. The first one is that it could be to reduce the duct losses. So obviously in the side pod, we have a radiator here. The primary intent of the inlet on the side pod is of course to provide cooling to the radiator. And then running through the side pod, we'll obviously have some form of ducting that will go down to the radiator and along to the radiator there. Now, if you have your, your inlet sit all the way at the front along there, then it's just gonna be generating a boundary layer and losses the whole way along it, right? So if you were to cut this particular portion of internal ducting off from there forwards, you would reduce the losses coming into the system. This means you get more flow across the radiator, you would get better cooling. So that's a positive thing. This is probably the most minor detail of the reasons that I've got to list. The next one is tunability. Now let's say that I have a certain inlet and ducting characteristic. I don't wanna be playing around with that too much but let's say that I want to have really good tunability at the front so that I have the option to go either leading edge up or down on this region to maybe get more pressure here or more suction here or maybe the other way around. We wanna pressurize here a little bit more. So I wanna have some flexibility in how I tune this particular region. If the inlet is decoupled from the forward edge, which we've done here, it means I can leave my inlet more or less fixed and just play around with moving this leading edge up and down as well as playing with other bits of geometry and curvature in this general region. Now, this is actually a very useful characteristic from an area development perspective, because let's say you do a change upstream, you can quickly adapt this particular portion of the bodywork to match whatever flow changes you've made. The next potential reason is the ability to position the leading edge of this higher. Let's say that I was finding performance by putting my leading edge up here somewhere to maximize the pressure across this entire region down here. If I wanted to go up that high, and I had my inlet running the whole way to the front, I wouldn't be able to physically move that up that much because my inlet area through here would get smaller and therefore I'd have cooling issues. Now you could fix this problem by moving this particular edge up and ending up with a geometry that is sitting higher like this. But the problem is, is that you only have so much legality box there. So you can't actually physically do that within the rules. So what do you do instead? Well, you can instead cut your leading edge back here and then that allows you to raise the leading edge of the lower element, 
keep the upper element leading edge rearwards and still meet your cooling demands because you're effectively drawing air in as if you'd raised the upper edge of the forward element as well. Now they're not doing this in this particular scenario, but the point is, is that they could if they wanted to, which is really what aero development is all about. It's about leaving doors open, particularly when you're at early phases in concept development. The next reason, and probably the most straightforward, is, is that they could have just gotten it as a straight up gain in the tunnel from a pressure manipulation perspective. If we moved the leading edge forwards to up here, what we'd have is that we'd have the stagnation pressure of the, the slower air at the inlet. Obviously it's not full stagnation because there is flow through the radiator, but basically you'd have the high pressure zone that this inlet's creating here. We should be able to move it a little bit further forwards as we move this leading edge forwards and get it here. But if we increase the high pressure here and stagnation here, chances are that we're going to end up with slightly more downwash down here as this deflects the air downwards. Now, if we have the angle of the air going down here more, let's say it was previously going in it this way and now it's angled down, what would happen is that you'd end up with more suction in this particular region here. So you'd end up with less overall pressure in this region here. Now, if you were trying to target the mid lower wake instead of the mid upper wake, that may not actually be a positive thing. So maybe they found that when they pulled this leading edge backwards, they were able to get a little bit more loading on the lower wing element, and I was able to get them slightly better lower mid weight control. So maybe that's what they've done here. The final one is that by pulling this back, they've been able to expose the vertical portion of the side of the side pod a little bit more, and you can see that obviously ties in quite well into their mirror stay, which is basically an extension of that portion of the side pod. So maybe by pulling that leading edge backwards, they were able to get this working a little bit more effectively, particularly the upper portion, and therefore get a little bit more outwash performance. And maybe that was a beneficial feature in terms of wake management. So anyway, those are a few theories I have on this side pod. I may have hit the mark, I may not have, we will never know. Let's move on further and talk about another super juicy bit, which is the floor edge, because this has some really cool stuff going on on it. And to start with, I'm going to go and look at a legality box. This is a shot of the legality boxes around the floor. Now the general gist is that everything that's shadowed by this particular floor region, you can't have any cutouts in, except for this particular region that is covered by this blue box here. Now in that blue box, you are allowed two sections in any Y slice. So basically what that means is that if I go and put a notch in here, and then we, we consider a Y slice running along there like that, we've got one section over here. So this is our one section here. And then we've got two section over here, happy days. Of course, you cannot just go and put two cuts like that because then we will have three sections in a Y slice. So that's a no go. You can't cut twice, you can only cut once. And then each of these cuts in terms of dimension has to be a minimum of 50 millimeters apart. So what Red Bull has done is that they've gone and had their floor go along straight and they go and they have their first cut along here. It looks like it's pretty much at 50 millimeters. And then what happens is, is that they run a secondary cut. And the way that they legalize the secondary cut is, is that they go to the back corner of this legality box and then they run it straight along. So this is horizontal line here and then they notch it out. So it becomes a notch like that. And as a result, because this is a horizontal line in a Y plane, they still only ever have two sections. They never have three. So it's still perfectly legal, but they've ended up with three discrete floor sections. This has of course allowed them to come up with some quite cool solutions for their floor. The first one is, is that here we have a region where they've been able to curl in both directions. So basically this is a full on curl kicking up here. So as the airflow is coming down here, it's going to get kicked up there, not just in, in a lateral sense, like most conventional curls, but also in a longitudinal sense. So any air flowing along the car gets picked up by the curl. So you can see that that's, that's quite a nifty little feature there. And what that should do is that should help produce more suction underneath the floor through here, uh, help with extraction from the frontal floor. And that should generally speaking, propagate in suction underneath the floor there. It will also help cast off any vorticity that is building up on this particular edge. Then on the other side of their first cut, what they've got is they've got a low leading edge and then they ramp it up into a fairly sizable curl and then ramp it again in there before it goes back into the final notch. Now I'd hazard a guess that a lot of this is around controlling the position and strength of any vorticity that comes off here that will probably end up getting ingested further downstream. But also what it means is that they haven't had to go 
and transition back in because they didn't have this notch. They'd have to go up and then they'd have to go back down again like that, kind of like the Mercedes wavy floor. So instead, what they've got is, is that they've, they've managed to make more or less a discontinuity that is still perfectly rules legal. It's worth noting too, that with this particular section of notch at the back, that Red Bull has not yet shown their floor edge wing concept. Now they could of course, go and put a floor edge wing in the forwards portion around that curl, that is a viable option for them, or they could just go and slap a floor edge wing as basically a floor slot in this region here, not dissimilar to say McLaren. Having this rearwards edge so far inboard may also help with getting a whole bunch of vorticity from that edge onto the, the tunnel roof much faster. You'll, you'll see the Red Bull does sort of run the floor edge diffuser kick up and potentially any vorticity that's shedding off the, the far edge may house itself underneath that. So they've certainly got options on where they could go from here. And it's a very interesting interpretation and way of dealing with the rules. In a system that's quite at odds with teams like Mercedes, what Red Bull has at the end is it has a secondary diffuser kick that continues to go high at the rearwards portion. So you can see this particular portion is very low here. This portion sits high and you can see that's essentially a mini diffuser with a high exit further forwards. Now this should theoretically help with downforce in this region and extraction from that region, but it's a bit of a balancing act because when you do something like this, you're going to pull your, your losses a little bit higher from this particular region because you're gonna generate more losses on this kick and you're gonna kick them up. So there may be a little bit of a trade off there in sort of mid floor suction versus further rearwards floor suction. This mini diffuser then transitions into quite a large uh, sidewall foot plate. Now I think this is the most aggressive sidewall foot plate on the grid and what you can see is that it comes down the sidewall and it curves out like that. And what that should do as mentioned in my AlphaTauri video is that it should direct some mass flow out that way towards the tire and any sort of vorticity that's being shed off the bottom edge here should get dragged a little bit closer to the tire and that can be used to help uh, with tire wake and tire squirt management. And here's just a shot from the rear where you can see just how big that foot plate is and how far back it goes. You can see it's got quite a progressive ramp down uh, from the forwards portion that kicks up. So it's really quite gentle. So obviously trying to keep the, the losses on that fairly controlled, but still trying to get that mass flow out towards the tire. We now get right to the rear with the beam wing. Now this is again a unique approach compared to the rest of the grid. And what it is is it's a single rear element beam wing with another sort of biplane beam wing over the top of it further forwards. And I predicted at the start of the launch season that a dual element beam wing wouldn't be strictly necessary to keep the flows attached. And a single element may be a more powerful way uh, of getting suction at the exit of the diffuser because you don't have the extra mass flow pouring through that you'd have if you had a bleed through from a dual element. And this implementation looks like it's more or less in line with that philosophy. Now Flowviz from testing confirmed that this beam wing is attached all over on the final element, although they only elected to Flowviz the rearwards element and the diffuser exit, not the forwards one. And this feeds well into two theories about this beam wing layout. The first is that the forwards element uh, is a legalizing device uh, for a more cranked rearwards beam wing. Now in the rules, the beam wing has to cover a certain amount of a legality surface that I've indicated in blue. Now, basically you aren't allowed to be able to see more than 80,000 millimeters squared of this particular surface here. So maybe their, their beam wing is a little too upright to actually cover the area that they need. So maybe they need to go and get themselves another beam wing further forwards that is going to cover the requisite amount of area such that the beam wing is legal. And I mean, that could very well be possible. You look at how vertical this is, you look at how tapered it off is to the edge, maybe it doesn't cover the amount of area it needs. However, there is of course another explanation for why they could be running the beam wing in this particular manner. If we look inside view, what you can see is that we have the top element more or less with a profile that's going like that. And then we've got the lower element with a profile that's arguably about as backed off at the edge, but way more cranked in the center, massively cranked through there compared to the top element, which holds a relatively constant level across the entire span. Now, when you look at the sheer amount of upwash that this beam wing would be getting in terms of what it would cause on the, the pressure side, it should be causing quite a lot of upwash there as well. Now, 
Obviously I can't be sure without the flow data and without having the proper geometry, but it does look that maybe that upper element could be downwashing versus the local flow. Now on face value that sounds a little bit silly because you'd end up with a high pressure region below it, you'd end up with suction on top of it, and as such it would generate local lift. However, it would actually protect the rear wing higher up a little bit from the upwash from the beam wing. If you have too much upwash from the beam wing, you'll offload your main rear wing. Also this high pressure at the bottom will interact with the top surface of the diffuser, so it will probably be largely negated. You'll have that little bit of suction at the top, but that will probably benefit the rear wing a lot. Now I probably wouldn't have believed or even come up with this theory if I hadn't have actually seen this exact effect happen in real life, where I've seen an overall downforce gain on the rear of cars by protecting a larger and more powerful rear wing from upwash from a lower down aero device. So that theory does sound a little bit crazy, I appreciate that, but it could potentially work. So overall, a very interesting car, and it'll be interesting to see what upgrades they bring and how it performs in the first race. Well, that's all for this analysis. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Leave a comment below on what video you'd like to see next from me, and hopefully, I'll see you next time.